who uh, can convince the, the economic leaders in the world, the political leaders, these transnational multilateral organizations, that they have to change their, their policy mm -hmm. in order to um, create a better world, yeah. a more justice world. You're asking who is the we? I think it is a just <laughs> question. You know, we often generalize, and many people generalize about Africa. And Africa is 800 million people and 54 countries. And there are big differences. There is a difference between Egypt and Nigeria, or between Nigeria and South Africa, between South Africa and Kenya. But uh, there are also commonalities between all the countries. Even if you have a country like South Africa, which is semi-industrialized, or Nigeria, which has a lot of oil, all of our countries are very dependent, are inserted as suppliers of raw materials to the more industrialized countries, including South Africa. South Africa's exports are mainly gold, diamond, coal, platinum, you know, uranium, those are the main exports, even from South Africa, which is a semi-industrialized country. So there are commonalities in the whole of Africa, very similar, although there are some differences of income. But when we say we, it is also because I think there is a strong understanding amongst many people in Africa, and I think in Latin America as well, of how our continent has common problems and has a subordinate and exploited insertion into the global economy. I think the Latin Americans invented the idea of the periphery of capitalism. Okay. And even a country like Brazil, which is big and developing and is called an emerging economy, is still in a very um, exploited and subordinate position. So the we is at some levels a generalization, but at other levels, politically and economically, it is justified. Um, when you say we, when you say why do we say we, I also, I am, by the way, I'm not South African, I'm Zimbabwean. <laughs> And I feel a very strong uh, affinity with the people of Africa. Um, and also, my work and the work of the that I work with are to work with the social movements in Africa to try and strengthen and develop their understanding, their skills, their courage, their cooperation amongst themselves. Because many countries do not have democratic regimes have very exploitative and self-serving governments who have been encouraged to become like that because of the privatization policies of the IMF and World Bank. And um, for us to change things in Africa, we have to strengthen um, African social movements. Um, that is the most important thing. Because democracy is not putting a piece of paper in a box. Democracy is having informed citizens who understand the issues, who are monitoring what governments are doing, who are demanding and who are offering alternatives. And in this, if I know I'm speaking to people in Europe, there's very important role that the social movements in Africa um, want European, progressive, conscientious Europeans to also play. The first thing is, you know, um, we don't need European development experts to come and show us how to dig wells or plant crops. Um, what we need is conscientious, progressive Europeans to give support to our social movements, material support, because that is very important. Okay. But even more important, many of our problems come from European governments, as I have been explaining, and from European companies. And um, we want European people to investigate that, to publicize that, to have the European population understand that Europe is not this great benevolent giver of aid to Africa. In fact, more money leaves Africa to come to uh, Europe than the other way. This has been established by the United Nations. Net outflow of resources to pay debt, to pay company profits, to pay um, companies to give services in our countries and so on. So there is an enormous pressure coming on Africa and other parts of the South from European governments and European companies. Um, they are not as bad as the United States. They don't come and bomb our countries and occupy our countries. But there 
are other ways of being very domineering and, and oppressive. And so we would want Europeans to be better informed by Africa. And the last thing I would say is, you know, the, the media, often the images they give of Africa is starving children and warlords and conflict and catastrophe and corrupt uh, leaders and so on. And that is a very distorted picture. It is not untrue, but it is very superficial and very incomplete. Because, you know, of 650 million people in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, the great majority work hard and struggle and try to produce for their families and, you know, endure conditions much worse than Europeans would ever accept, you know. And um, particularly the women in Africa, they are so courageous and they are so hardworking and they are so creative, okay. And so Europeans must also see that Africans are not just victims. They are trying to deal with their problems and survive and care for their children and so on and so forth. But in order to survive, if these conditions continue, if there's no hope for people to survive in their communities and in their countries, they will migrate to where they can survive. And that is why you are seeing tens of thousands of Africans take, risking their lives to cross the sea to come to Europe to survive. Okay? Um, but of course, you know, I don't know how many million African migrants there are in Europe. Five million, ten million, I don't know. But what we know is that there are more than 600 million Africans struggling to survive within their own countries and migrating between their own countries. Many migrants come to South Africa because South Africa they see is relatively vegetal. So, you know, there are three million Zimbabweans in South Africa struggling to survive. So that is one thing, you know, people will migrate in order to survive. And we have to find solutions for people to live in their own communities and their own countries so that they are comfortable and, and secure. But there's another dimension for the whole world to understand, whether it is in Indonesia, or in Africa, in Brazil, you know, if people cannot find the means to survive, they will destroy their environment to survive. They will cut down the forests, they will overfish in the rivers, and that will contribute, and they will burn coal in order to have energy. And that will contribute to global warming, and that will contribute to the global climate crisis that we have. Of course, the biggest crisis of the global um, environment comes from big corporations. It does not come from poor people. They are the victims of the climate crisis. And it is the big corporations, the mining companies, and the forestry companies, and the big transporters, and the oil companies, they are polluting the world's environment. Okay? And they are putting the world in peril, there's no question about it. And it is the poor who will suffer most. Um, but they will also suffer in the sense of struggling to deal with their own environment. And just to conclude, this global crisis, environmental crisis that faces the whole world, um, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the authoritative uh, panel of hundreds of scientists, you know, has put before the world the scenario that is facing the world. And included in that is their prediction of how uh, global climate change will affect the whole world. The rising sea level, the devastation of the forests and so on. And they predict that something like 270 million more people in Africa will sink into poverty because we, desertification will spread in Africa in some areas. In other areas, we will have uneven and unpredictable rain patterns and flooding. By the way, we are seeing lots of flooding in the world today, and Africans don't have means to deal with flooding. We will see the erosion of the coast, which is happening. We will see the loss of our fishing resources, which is happening. So, and however Europeans 
struggle to deal with climate change. They will have to struggle to change their lifestyle, to deal with climate change. It will be much worse for the poor people because they don't have resources to change and to deal with, with climate change. So I suppose that is the scenario that is bigger than the economic crisis. The economic crisis is the climate crisis has been produced by the nature of the economic system. There is no question, and we have, and the industrial um, revolution and the industrialization of the last 200 years, and especially the last decades, has created the global um, climate crisis, ecological and environmental crisis. But it is the countries and people that did not contribute to climate change who are going to suffer the worst effects.